The tree of enlightenment was tall and understanding. Its trunk was diamond, its main boughs were lapis lazuli. Its branches and twigs were of various precious elements. The leaves, spreading in all directions, provided shade like clouds. The precious blossoms were of various colors. The branching twigs spread out their shadows. Also the fruits were jewels containing a blazing radiance. They were together with the flowers in great arrays. The entire circumstance emanated light. Within the light there reigned precious stones, and within each gem were enlightened beings, in great posts like clouds, simultaneously, by virtue of the awesome spiritual power of the Buddha. The tree of enlightenment constantly gave forth glowing sounds, speaking various truth without end. The palace chamber in which the Buddha was situated was spacious and beautifully adorned. It extended throughout the ten directions. It was made of jewels of various colors. It was decorated with all kinds of precious flowers. The various adornments emanated lights like clouds. Masses of the reflections from within the palace formed banners. A boundless host of enlightened beings, the congregation at the sight of enlightenment, we're all gathered there. By means of the ability to manifest the lights and inconceivable sounds of the Buddhas, they fashioned nets of the finest jewels from which came forth all the realms of action and the spiritual powers of the Buddhas, in which were reflected images of the abodes of all beings. Also, by virtue of the aid and spiritual power of the Buddha, they raised the entire cosmos in a single thought. Their lying seats were high, wide, and beautiful. The bases were made of jewels, their nets of lotus blossoms, their towers of pure existed gemstones. They were adorned with various flowers of all colors. Their roofs, chambers, steps, and doors were adorned by the images of all things. The branches and fruits of jewel trees surrounded them, arrayed everything. Clouds of radiance and jewels reflected each other. The Buddhas of the Ten Directions conjured regal pearls and the exquisite jewels and the top knots of all the enlightened beings all in the light, which came illuminated for them. Furthermore, sustained by the spiritual power of all Buddhas, they expanded the vast perspective of the enlightened beings. Their subtle tones extending the far, and they did not place the the sight of enlightenment in uh, Sanskrit is Aranya. The sight of enlightenment can not only be a physical place, but also a place in our mind and in our hearts. Aranya is a place where the Bodhi resolve is generated. So whenever we're developing our resolve for Bodhi, resolve for Buddhahood, then uh, we are growing our Bodhi in the Aranya, in the sight. Not only is it in the physical sense, but also very much in our minds, but they go hand in hand. It's the mind working with the physicality and the physicality work with the mind. The most simple example that I think of is that oftentimes when we think of something that makes us happy, a happy memory or what have you, we naturally smile. But we could also do the same thing with a smile and then it conjures up a sense of joy, especially in the transmission of the Buddha Dharma from East to West, the focus has been on meditation, insight, meditation, vipassana, uh, meditation being so popular. The sitting and the focus on the mind is crucial. The wish to help, to do something, it's a bodhisattva ideal that hasn't yet been shared much in, in the West because the West mostly knows about mindfulness and meditation. But there, either the, the desire to help comes from the Protestant being a good Samaritan, how the striving to help actually stems from that calm place of our sight and enlightenment. Those who have already resolved to actually change an institution's structure, whether it's organizational culture or society, culture, legislation, industry practices. We very much admire how, uh, on the one hand, um, helping simply by presence or simply by 
one person helping another, but this idea of social justice on a collective level, hopefully deepen its roots um, in the West as the Bodhisattva ideal, a Mahayana ideal that hasn't been shared so much. Most of those who are into mindfulness are interested in the benefits that it brings to them personally. In Clary's translation, in like mean beings, bodhisattvas, I can appreciate his translation in that enlightening beings it means that they're still in the process of specifically enlightening themselves and enlightening others. Bodhisattvas know that they are helping others and by helping others they're helping themselves. And at the same time, they know that it's not just an outward focus on external relationships and uh, and building relationships, because sometimes that can spiral into further transmigration. The Bodhisattvas here, it's as if um, their decor, (laughs) they don't seem very real. They're, They're radiating light. They're cheerleaders who are these bodhisattvas. You start from the beginning with kind of a panoramic view of what the site of enlightenment is like. And then the picture frame zooms in on tree and on the palace and then on the seat. So it gets smaller and smaller. It goes from the kind of the macro to the micro to the large to the small. And this is part of the very much the theme of the Avatamsaka Sutra. This going that size or space and time essentially flow into one another. Larger to the smaller and then the small to the large. They're very much inner exchangeable. Most of these are in the spatial sense you know, because they're objects. But from the smallest atom in, in the seat or jewel can enter the greatest expanse of the site and enlightenment. The site enlightenment can entirely fit in a matter of a thought. How porous the borders are. This can also apply to uh, time. In Chinese, the the word for world is it consists of um, time and space, space and time. So the world is, uh, so far in what we've read, we've got the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas. I actually like to say a little bit more. Clearly translates Buddha as the single Buddha, and obviously he's referring to the historical Buddha, of the land of Magadha in India. Or is it to interpret that we're talking about Buddhas uh, in the plural? Because there can be multiverses, that if one universe is, is only in an atom of an atom, then how many atoms are there? So there are multiverses and there are multiple Magadha, Magadhas and multiple Buddhas and not to mention then uh, how many Bodhisattvas around each Buddha. The language as a convention really limits us to sometimes the way to describe what it is our experience or what we could experience. Buddha singular versus Buddha's plural lead to very different ideas. Dharma, the clouds of radiance and jewels reflected each other. He uses a colon, and then the Buddhas of the ten directions conjured regal pearls, and etc. So his using a colon right here is an interpretation of the text. Clouds actually become essentially the setting, and then the, the Buddhas either from them or um, out of them, whatever pearls, jewels, and, and etc. Versus, if I were just to change that punctuation mark to a uh, semicolon, then it would be a different interpretation. Mm-hmm. That the clouds is merely another aspect of the Buddha's mm-hmm. manifestation of those pearls and jewels and gems. That's why I like to look at both Chinese and English, and I can imagine those who know Sanskrit, if they were to look at Sanskrit, although I understand you know, some are quite different, and not to mention they are non-existent right now in so many chapters. Mm-hmm. Not only is it that the words will lead us to different ways to view the Dharma, 
even if we're looking at the same language, the way that we interpret it, so very much varies how many different possible interpretations you can have looking at one line or one paragraph of the of the teachings, and possibly all or many of the interpretations can be correct, um, and that there is not just one supreme interpretation. In our real world, though, is really the case that interpretation that dominate is from those with with the publication or with the institutional power or with the, with certain status. Looking at uh, the final line, they expound the. This is a crucial point: the emphasis on the power of the Vedas and how as they share the Dharma. Here's a Bodhisattva contemplation. Also, by virtue of the aid of the spiritual power of the Buddha, they embrace the entire cosmos in a single thought. So, who are the they? The Bodhisattvas, right? The Bodhisattvas, with the aid of the Buddha, they practice this particular practice. Yeah, this is embrace the entire cosmos in a single thought. Try that for a few minutes. I mean, this idea of embracing. I actually think it doesn't work. Our tendency is to grab onto and embrace, and then there, and we actually create limits with our limited lengths of of arms, what have you. There's a analogy in another sutra that talks about how to capture the greatest expanse or the greatest amount of air, what size container would you actually use? The size of a bowl, a bathtub. Or you know, size of a, a semi truck. The greatest size of uh, of air, of space, of emptiness, or greatest expanse you could capture is when there's no container.